Welcome to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. In this episode's main segment, I'm going to be talking with filmmaker Jacob Stewart. He runs screenwriting staff in Utopia and has numerous writing credits, including many award-winning shorts. I'm going to be talking to him about the importance of getting some quality first credits and how it's helped his career. So stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please give me a review in iTunes, or if you're watching this on YouTube, please give it a like and leave a comment. I'm really trying to improve this podcast, so some honest, constructive feedback is very much appreciated. Please also share these podcast episodes with anyone who you think could get some value out of them. If you have a screenwriting-related blog, please link to the podcast, or if you're on Twitter or Facebook, please share it with your friends. You can find the full blog post at sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. This really is how word spreads on the internet. Internet, so it's greatly appreciated. I'd like to thank some of the folks who liked the podcast and commented on it. In the iTunes UK section, I got a nice review from Super Bat Hulk. He actually left the review back in September, but I didn't know how to find reviews from other countries. He's in the UK, so thank you for that. And then over in the Australian version of iTunes, I got a nice review from Wazman01. Thank you for that. Again, he left the review after the first episode, but I didn't know to check comments from other countries. And over at YouTube, um, I'd like to thank Ginger Shine, Aiden Green, Keith K, and Pamela Wilford. Pamela asked about how, oh, how long a short script should be. In today's main segment, I'm going to be interviewing Jacob Stewart, who has a lot more experience with shorts than I do, and he'll answer this question in more depth. But the quick answer is basically this. What you want to do is look at Craig's list and look at what people are asking for. But in general, the shorter, the better. If you keep it to three to five pages and one, maybe two locations and two maybe three or four actors it's something that can be shot on a Saturday and edited on a Sunday when you're submitting to film festivals it really doesn't matter how long or how short the short film is a five-minute short is basically the same as a 25-minute short in fact short films that are very short are probably easier to program and fit into the schedule so I think there's a good chance that a really short short film would have a better chance of getting into a festival this is definitely a case where you want quality over quantity. You want to make sure the script is really tight and really good and and just cut, cut, cut and make it as lean as possible. Just make sure the concept is interesting and unique and it's well written. And in terms of IMDb, they all count the same. It doesn't matter whether your short is five minutes or 25 minutes. It'll look the same on IMDb. So from a producer's standpoint, they'll get more bang for their buck with a five-minute short than a 25-minute short. If a producer finds a script he likes, he's not going to toss it because it's too short. But if he finds something he likes that's too long, he very well might not have the resources to produce it. So from a writer's standpoint, I think you'll have an easier time getting a five-minute script produced than a 25-minute script produced. Also, I recently created a three-part video series, which I posted on YouTube, about how to find these sorts of leads and how to automate a lot of the process. I literally do a screencast and show you exactly how to find producers looking for screenplays, especially shorts, and then how to automate the process so you can easily find these leads. I'll link to it in the show notes. So for whatever reason, the people that watch the podcast over at YouTube seem much more active in commenting than the people who listen via iTunes. I suspect it's because YouTube allows episode level comments while iTunes just allows comments on the podcast in general. You can't actually comment on a specific episode. In any event, to try and generate some iTunes reviews, I'm going to be giving away one free email fax blast to everyone who leaves a review on iTunes from now until the end of January. This fax email blast is the same blast that I use for my own screenplays and it's the same blast that I sell on my blog. So just leave me an honest review on iTunes and then during the first episode in February, I'll randomly pick a winner. And they'll have their choice of either a free agents and managers blast or a free producers blast. Also, I'll be picking a name from everyone who has posted a comment, including the people who have already posted. So if you already posted a comment, you're already entered to win. I'm not a lawyer, so I really don't know all the legal ramifications of, of a contest like this, but I'll just say this, void where prohibited. So if you listen on this, listen to this on iTunes, please do leave me a comment and rate this podcast. Thank you. A couple of quick notes. Any web websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. The transcripts usually take a week to produce, so sometimes the episode will go live 
and the transcript won't be available for a week afterwards. I apologize for that. It takes a week to get the transcript created, so it really depends how far in advance I'm able to record the podcast. Usually, I end up recording it on a Friday and releasing it on a Monday, so the transcript will usually be available by the following Friday. You can find the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts. Also, if you want my free guide, How to Sell Your Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional logline and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. It really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. A quick few words about what I'm working on. I'm currently writing a spec comedy screenplay, which I would say is going a little sideways. It's not really working that well, and I'm not so sure it was such a great idea, but I'm probably two-thirds of the way through, so I'm just going to push through it and see if I can salvage it. I think I have a good ending, so hopefully that will carry the day. It's not really like anything else I've written, which is the main reason I wanted to write it. It'll give me some additional variety. It's a kind of a dark romantic comedy. But the other thing I'm working on is polishing up a sci-fi thriller screenplay that I wrote several years ago. I always liked the script, but never really did a lot with it. I guess I had scripts I liked better or thought could be sold more easily, so I never really did a big push to get this one out there. I'm going to finish polishing the script up this week and blast it out next week using my email and fax blast service. I've honestly never tried to sell a script like this, so I'm not sure how well it's going to be received. It's not super high budget, but it's not something you could do for a few hundred thousand dollars either. So we'll see. So now let's get into the main segment. Today, I talk with filmmaker Jacob Stewart. He's a real hustler, an entrepreneur, and a produced screenwriter. Here's the interview. Thank you, Jacob, for coming on the Selling Your Screen Pay podcast. I really appreciate your taking some time to talk with me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. So let's just start out maybe by giving the listeners sort of a brief um, sort of background of how you got started in the business and what you've done up until now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I went to film school, went to Los Angeles Film School in uh, 2009 through 2010. Um, my concentration was in screenwriting. Um, there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of teaching and screenwriting uh, at, the, at school, so I kind of had to do a lot of um, teaching myself and finding my way and working on set and finding a bunch of mentors. Um, but I've found a lot of success since then, and I've been very blessed because of that. Um, a lot of my successes come from short films. Um, I've won awards for my shorts. I've had scripts sold, uh, features, and shorts. Um, I had a script option that was uh, tasked with Warner Brothers. Um, because of the short, I got a, a screenwriting agent. And um, now I partner with a, a gentleman who was um, one of the executive uh, directors for the Academy Awards in 2000, um, running screenwriting staff in Utopia, which send out leads daily for um, people looking to pay screenwriters to work and to sell their screenplays. Great. So maybe we could break down that even a little bit. Um, maybe you could tell us, like, one of sort of your first major shorts that you you wrote, um, and kind of go through the process of how you did it and what it actually ended up doing for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my first short, as far as um, success, was a short script that was under twenty minutes um, called Montana, and it was actually my thesis film for the LA Film School. Um, but there was some controversy with the storyline and um, budget and so forth. So I decided to not use any of the resources from the school and because I had the funding, do it on my own. So I flew out to Ohio and shot the entire film. But not only did I write it, but I had to produce it and assistant direct it. Um, I mean, pretty much everything from lighting to all of that and budgeting, being a line producer. So I got my hands with to understand how hard it is not just to make a film, but a short film. Um, but it was very rewarding. And once that film got made, I had a, a, an extreme amount of success. It got into three international film festivals, won an award in uh, Houston, um, had two newspaper, print newspapers that wrote about it, got me on the radio, and most importantly, it had two weeks run on TV, which was extremely exciting because it had just so much potentials to have, you know, an award next to having go to film festivals and network, um, you know, be on the radio, have people, you know, garner attention and so forth. So Montana was probably the first one that launched my career. 
So um yeah, let's that sounds good. Let's um let's break that down. So what was the budget a little bit on on Montana? The budget was fifteen thousand. Um almost five thousand of that was done in LA until we realized we couldn't shoot it. So when I went to Ohio I had ten grand to work with that short, which I find pretty it's a very nice amount for shorts. Uh huh, sure. And it's it's twenty minutes, you said? Yeah, it's under twenty minutes. So how did you end up getting it on television? What was the process there, and, and where did it run on TV? Well, we had someone that um, worked on the crew who was like a PA on and on Whitewater uh, Community TV in Indiana, which airs in 12 different cities. And they said, okay, well, you have to sub- you have to send a submission form, which is like that with most TV. You know, of course, you send in a DVD, but you have to fill out. Um, all this information, and once it's submitted, they review it, and they decide if they want it, and they accepted it, which was fantastic. And do you think winning some awards at festivals, was that a part of the process, and you think that helped you actually get the acceptance? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That came, I mean, being on TV came after the festivals. I mean, um, anyone who's familiar with film festivals, especially the larger ones, um, you know, when you fill out the submission for that, they want to know, you know, have you placed, have you nominated, did you win? Because, you know, a lot of the larger film festivals you know, they, they want to know someone else has recognized your work. And it goes the same with TV as well. They want to know mm-hmm. someone else has recognized your work. Now, it, was there any money? Did this TV station end up paying you some money to air the the show? No, this one didn't. I mean, there's been some. I've had, I have some friends who've done that and they've gotten money. I have, uh, I had a, a director friend who did a short. He airs on PBS twice a, a year and uh, $2,000 check for each time. So four grand. I mean, that's, that's amazing for a short script. Yeah, sure, sure. So then what what kind of a um, f- format did it fit in? Was it like a show that showed award-winning short films? Or did it, like what what was the sort of the format of the show that it aired in? A lot of stuff, yeah, exactly. They, um, they like to take um, local, well, when I say local, like stuff in the Midwest and, and show good, you know, shorts or comedy stand-ups or something, trying to, you know, explain both some of the good talent there. And since the film was shot in Ohio and Indiana, you know, they, of course, love that. I see. I see. So um, let's take a step back to the festivals. Um, you said you got into three festivals. Um, how many festivals, if you don't mind sharing that information, one of the things I really like to do on my blog is sort of demystify the process. And I know for myself as an independent film producer is that, you know, to get into three festivals mean you probably submitted to 30 festivals. So I'm curious, how many festivals did you actually submit to and sort of what was your ratio of getting accepted? I submitted to, and I would have to go back, but probably about eight or nine. And the thing was is that I submitted as soon as I did the, the film. Like I started submitting, and I got I rejected by, I want to say, three or four. It wasn't until a year later until it just seemed like I was being accepted, accepted, and accepted. And then, yeah, it's a lot of trial and error. I had one film festival who put me on their slate and then decided they didn't have enough time and tossed me. I mean, yeah, it's <laughs> always up and down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was there anything sort of political to get into the festivals you did, or it was just a cold submission and they liked it and they took it, or did you have some sort of a contact at the festival? No, it was, you know, just, you know, doing your research on maybe like without a box or online and finding festivals that, you know, might um, would be more willing to accept this kind of film and then just filling it out and sending it in. And, you know, yeah, there is. It's $50, $60 that's part of the budget to, you know, just submit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so then... Um, can you tell us sort of the ripple effect that Montana had for your career, um, you know, helping you get an agent, helping you sell a feature? Um, what kind of happened to your career after after Montana had a little bit of success? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, in that kind of year, um, without, like, Montana ex- receiving those awards, I worked on all sorts of stuff. I've, I mean, I've worked on shows with NBC, TLC, I mean, doing um, A&E, just, you know, doing basic things and, I kind of had to put screenwriting on the back burner because it wasn't really making money um, as far as screenwriting goes. But once all that stuff started happening with Montana, you know, I could that stuff was online. I was on IMDb. I networked with producers and so forth. So when I was sending out, you know, resumes for anything, even on Craigslist or like an ink tip or something for um, looking to hire a screenwriter, I could say, hey, I'm an award-winning producer screenwriter and you know I had a sample to show them I had a video reel you know so all that stuff um you know gave me a little bit of credibility but once I optioned um uh, a, a feature script called colorblind with Warner Brothers attached um I was sending out information trying to get an agent 
Well, I had a few interests in some, you know, part of getting an agent's a lot of objections, but the Barone Literary Agency had contacted me and said, hey, hey, I like your script. You know, what else do you have? And she was going through my information. She said, hey, it looks like you have a successful short. Can I watch it? Absolutely. So I sent it to her. When she saw it the next day, she called me. She said, I love it. Great writing, great dialogue, great story. I want to bring you on. So guess what? She pretty much represented four of my scripts. Two of them were shorts. She's actually sold one of my shorts called Old Brother, which was back in 2012. But once getting an agent changes everything. So since then, I've sold four shorts. Um, of course, I've sold some features, too, and I've worked with production company and development. But each time you have something produced, it's just another credit to add, which gives you more you know, interest in the community. But it all started with Montana, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you said um, that the this agent contacted you. How did she find you? She didn't find me. I went through, and you can do stuff from everything from IMDb Pro, just looking up agents and sending out blind queries. I mean, you can I at see. least have two features, you know, they say, and send it out. And and she read the script and, you know, fortunately looked me up, saw about Montana, said, can I, can I see it? Sent it to her. I see. I see. So, so maybe let's take a step back and, and tell us about how did you um, option the script to Warner Brothers, colorblind script to Warner Brothers? With this script in particular, um, I actually I put it on Intip, and Intip is, is just a wonderful service. And had a um, a producer uh, who wanted to put three films on a slate to take place in Chicago. This film took place in Chicago. Optioned it. You know, it's still being, you know, auctioned and pushed around, but they have Warner Brothers on the back end, and yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty much how that one got optioned. I see, I see, through Ink Tip. So, and then you mentioned, too, that you had you sold a feature recently? Yeah, I just sold a feature in June, I believe, of uh, Crossing Flowers to Mongol Ink. So, uh, and that was another one of just kind of networking and talking to people and see who was interested in what. And one of my biggest things that um, I'm a firm believer in these days is if you're trying to get produced work or sell your stuff, to keep the budget minimal, keep the location, keep, I mean, all that down. And this one was called Crossing Flowers, and it takes place in a motel with three, three actors. That's it. And, of I course, see. with budget these days. People love that. But one of the interesting things about Crossing Flowers was I wrote a short called The Motel back in 2011. Um, it was 12 pages. I got it sold in 2012, but I kind of liked that whole idea about being in a motel, so I decided to make a feature on that. So, I mean, that's another good reason to do shorts as well, kind of, you know, helps you think outside the box. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can just break that process down a little bit. You said you did some networking um, for to to get Crossing Flowers um, sold. What exactly was that networking? One of the things that I do with screenwriting, staffing, utopia is um, I have a bunch, you know recruiters talking to producers and, and cinematographers and actors and so forth. And a lot of people, if you've worked on set, you know your PA, your craft service guy is a director, you know, the next day, you know, he's directing his own stuff. And I'm all, I'm constantly contacting companies looking, you know, who are you looking for a writer? Are you looking for this? And then because screenwriting staffing is becoming so big now, I have people contact me. Well, there's an actor in New Jersey who's been looking for a role, um, and he has the connections um, to, to make the film. But he was looking for, like, an artsy kind of role. So I got in contact with him. We networked. He loved the he loved the film, thought it was something that he could act in. He has the resources to get like to get a name actor and that's what they're pushing for now. So it's just about to never dismiss if someone's not a producer. I think that's the biggest misconception. It's like only network to producers. No. Everyone is important in this industry, especially when selling a script. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Um, so maybe take us back to um, the screenwriting staff in Utopia. How did you get that started, and 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 sort of what is that, and and just a background on that? Yeah, um, like I said, after I finished film school, you know, I had debt and but and a degree, and I didn't feel like I had a lot of. Um, you know, they taught me how the basics, how to write a story, you know, how to do dialogue, you know, blah blah blah, but no one taught. I mean, how to sell a script or how to look for work. And what's the point of knowing if you have structure if you don't know how to get your work out there? So I had to literally teach myself. I mean, tons of books, asking tons of people, finding mentors, and searching all over online for places, you know, who are looking for that 
kind of stuff. And luckily, there are some good resources out there, like an ETIP, for instance. Um, where, you know, they kind of are the middleman between those two. But that was back in 2009, 2010. It's starting now to have more like that, but there wasn't a lot then. So it was a lot of just finding this stuff and finding it for years and years. And I finally realized that by doing this, I know all the places to look. I have the connections. I have the emails. And I know how to search for these jobs. And once you know you have that database, you no longer have to search for it. They come looking for you. And I figured, you know, so many screenwriters don't know how to sell their work. I mean, I talk to screenwriters all the time who have, I mean, up to 30 screenplays but can't sell one of them. Yeah, you know, it could be a store. Maybe they don't have the right story. But most of the time, they just don't know where where to begin, where to sell. And that's what we do with screenwriting staffing. Um, we send you the information. We send, if you're a premium member, you get it daily with people looking for a screenwriter, looking to sell a screenplay, or it could just be as simple as someone looking to partner. I mean, we cater to novice writers all the way up to WGA writers. And it's simple. You don't have to search the web all day, going through Craigslist. It's where you don't know these people. It's sent to straight to your email. That's it. Done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I had a similar experience. Um, I actually got a master's degree from CSUN in communications with an emphasis in screenwriting. And it was exactly what you're saying was there was no classes on actually how to sell or even even classes on how to write a query letter, how to write a log line. It was all very, you know, the hero with a thousand faces and, and all this sort of very theoretical stuff. And I think I think colleges and universities do themselves a big disservice. And, and really, I was in exactly the same position. And that's kind of why I started selling a screenplay.com because I felt the same way that you did, that there was very, very little information and help about, um, about how to actually go about selling something. Absolutely. So let's take a step back to these shorts that you've sold. Um, you just, you know, you don't have to tell us specifically, but what's a range for somebody to expect when they write a short film? How much can they expect to earn? Um, you know, how many pages were these shorts and, and roughly what kind of range in, in dollar amount can someone expect to get? Well, like I said before, I write all my short scripts. Now, Montana was a little different, but the ones that I have sold um, has been limited to two locations. Um, so if you're going to sell a short for that kind of, you know, with maybe four or five actors max, one or two locations, under 10 pages, assuming that, you know, a page a minute, you got to expect that the company itself has a, a low budget they're on a shoestring, and they're not going to be pitching out a bunch of money to to make this. So I've, I've sold four shorts and I've never made over $100, but I've never made less than 65 either. I always tell people who are writing shorts, don't expect any more than $500. It's a short mm-hmm. film, and most people who go into short films, um, you know, who, who are directly cinematographers, are doing it for the same reason as you are, to get credits, to get to the festivals, you know, on and on and on. So be mm-hmm. reasonable. Don't expect WGA rates. I mean, I know like Pixar and Disney do shorts all the time, but they're contracting their own writers. You know, they're not, you know, throwing an ad up on credit for the same, you know, short. So, yeah. and one of the things at, at screenwriting staffing is I do get, I've been so surprised on how many people are wanting to do shorts now, especially like actors and like geeks and so forth, you know, wanting to find the right project. So I kind of see, you know, if they're looking to buy a short or not, um, I've never come to SSU seen anyone wanting to buy a short for more than $500. And I see a lot who are looking not to buy. But there is money there, and people are willing to, to pay. And if you can just even make 25 or $50 on a short, hey, you sold something. You know, that's, that's important for a, a novice screenwriter or even an experienced screenwriter, you know. Mm-hmm. No, I totally agree. I mean, even $100 or, as you say, $50, all of a sudden you are a professional. Maybe it's not on a super high budget, but the bottom line is someone has given you money for writing, and that's a big threshold to cross going from a novice mm-hmm. with no credits to someone that's actually a professional. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're being paid to be a screenwriter, and that's what's important. I mean, that's everyone's goal. So on, on when you're finding these these leads um, on Craigslist or wherever your screenwriting staff in Utopia, are there certain questions that you ask and that you know our listeners could potentially ask to kind of ferret out the the better ones from the worst ones? I mean, one thing that I've found over the years, and, and I'm sure you have too, is you know there's a lot of people with good intentions. I'm not really one of these conspiracy theorists that people are out to rip writers off or anything else, but there's a lot of people out there that have good intentions, but they're not necessarily that organized, and I've been a part since I've been out here. A lot of production 
productions where, you know, the thing just never quite materializes properly. And, you know, I'm sure you, the last thing you want to do is give someone a script for $25 and have them not make it because the whole point of this is not the $25. It's to get a credit. Um, is there some, some maybe red flags that you've seen from people that you say, yeah, this guy doesn't seem like he's really that credible? Um, maybe the way the ads are written, maybe just from talking to the people, anything that we can look out for? Yeah, absolutely. I don't use um, Craigslist uh, much anymore. I mean, I've never, I mean, I admit for some personal work, but never really for SSU. But when I contact these companies or they contact me, um, you know, one of the most important things is uh, have they produced anything? Have they shown, you know, an effort to produce something? Um, there are a lot of, um, okay, let me, let me back up. One of the first things I tell people with short films is if a film student is looking for a short, do it. Give it away because they're going to make it. They have the equipment at the school, they have the drive, the inspiration, and they have some talent, and they got the mentors at the school. Do it. Let them do it. Um, if you're looking, and same with actors, one of the things I do, I do say with actors is, is a lot of actors now, you know, they're not getting a role, so they're looking for a short, um, so that they can, you know, act in it. Um, and I think that's great. But actors don't, most actors don't know exactly how that filmmaking process works. So I would be a little careful if, you know, you just have an actor, they don't have anything lined up. I mean, there's no offense to them, but a lot of them just don't understand that. I always recommend to sell to cinematographers and DPs. They have the lighting, they have the camera, they even have lav mics and all that. They can make the film. You know, are they directors? You know, do they have, are they creative geniuses? Maybe not. They have it to make it, so you know that's going to be made. And of course, you know, if they got, if you got a production company, you know, I always like to see do they have credits? Have they made something? What, what is their website? Is it a professional website? You know, that's how they're going to make the film as well. Um, you know, maybe talk to them on the phone, talk to them on email, see how they compose themselves, or if they, can they even put a sentence together and so forth. And you can kind of see those things. But I will say with short films, I, from the shorts that our members have sold, I've sold or my friends have sold, most of them get made. Um, I, like I said, I've sold four shorts in one year. Two of them have been made, the other ones in pre-production. That's a 50%, you know, turnaround. I think that's mm -hmm. great. Feature films don't get made that quickly. So yeah. I think most people are looking for shorts are, 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 are looking, are, are going to do it, are going to jump into it. They have the best intentions in mind, like you said. But red flags are people who, when they, you know, they post something, it could be on a Mandy or Craigslist or anything, when they're just saying, you know, I'm looking for a short, send it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, real people are putting the John where they want, you know, how many pages, the festivals that they want to submit in. I mean, these people already have it lined up. The only thing they're missing is the script. So if you see that, that's good, you know. I know some people roll their eyes. Oh, I'm looking to submit it to cans. Well, don't don't necessarily roll your eyes. At least they have a goal with what they want to do with the short. So, mm. I mean, that's kind of the things I look at. Yeah, 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 sure. So um, I I'm curious, too. Um, I, are you lo You're located in Las Vegas, correct? Yeah, I was, I was located in L.A. for four years and been in Vegas for about six, seven months now. Okay, and how have you found living outside of L.A. as far as, you know, keeping your career moving forward and that kind of stuff? I mean, um, has it been a hindrance to live, you know, five, six hours away? No, definitely not. Um, since I've been doing screenwriting, I have lived in Ohio, I have lived in Indiana, I lived in Texas, and now I'm living in Nevada, and that's after living four years in L.A., and I have, when it comes to working on set, of course, in LA all the, all day. But when it comes to writing, absolutely not. I tell people that they don't have to live in LA. I mean, so many people are paying through PayPal and, and working online, sending, you know, the script over, sending the treatment. Hey, can you work on this? A lot of times you don't really have to meet. And with Skype now and all that, you know, you can still do your face to face time. And another thing is inspiration. I know it's so hard, and some writers can conquer this. I wasn't one of them to stay inspired in L.A. Hmm. It, it's very, very difficult. For uh -huh. me, I like to, you know, I kind of like the quiet. Uh -huh. So, no, so I mean, I don't, I don't see any... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead and finish. Oh, oh I was just going to say, most of them, um, we have a... Our, our demographics for SSU is probably only about 40% are from L.A. We have people from all over the world. And being the middleman with the company 
and the writer, we see who hires who, who buys what. And I, the last project we just did was someone in L.A. who hired someone in mm-hmm. Michigan, and then they never met each other. So, I mean, they contracted a right. So that's just an example. You don't have to. I mean, you don't, I mean, I think with TV you do, absolutely. But with feature mm-hmm. film, I don't think it's mandatory. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious. Um, I know with my own, I have not done a lot with shorts, but I know I've definitely worked on the independent films and, and lower budget independent films. Um, one of the things that I always find is, you know, the people are not paying a lot, but sometimes they expect a lot in terms of rewrites and that kind of stuff. How do you handle something like that? A, a producer who wants to pay you a hundred dollars, but wants, you know, a hundred hours worth of rewrites. No, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, it's, it's so difficult. Um, I guess if you're going to sell a short, yeah, it's such a difficult question. They do. They they want the short. They like it, but they're saying, hey, um, we only have this bedroom for the location or, hey, this dialogue um, we kind of see on the nose. Hey, can you change it for this? Or, hey, we have this actor who's Hispanic. Can you change him from being Caucasian to Hispanic? You know, whatever. And they they ask for all this. And sometimes, you know, yeah, the pay is so... Low, so you kind of have to. I think as a writer, you have to decide, you know, how important is it to make a hundred, and how important is it to see this film being made. And and and, but you know, a lot. If someone's willing to put out a hundred dollars for a short, I don't think it's too much to ask to say, hey, you're asking for five or six hours. You know, I need ten dollars an hour for that. I, I've said that. I've said that when I've written feature. When I, you know said, okay, I'll do two drafts, and then they're bombarding me with a third and fourth draft. I'm like, hey, I'll be happy to help you, but you're going to have to pay for my services. Um, but no, that's a really struggling thing with shorts, because you're, and this isn't across the line, but a lot of times when you're dealing with filmmakers who are starting out who want to do a short, they're not very experienced either, and they don't know what to expect, and they don't understand the importance of a script and a screenwriter. So you need to stick up for yourself. You know, You need to say, hey, this requires time. Or just say, hey, I don't want this change. This works. You know, you either take it for what it is or not. But every screenwriter needs to be flexible because it doesn't matter if you're working with Universal Studios or not. You're going to have to expect to be to, to rewrite. So, mm-hmm. you know, you need to go into that. But stick up for yourself, you know. Sure, sure. Now, I'm curious, are there um, contracts? Obviously, when there's such a little bit amount of money, um, you can't very well afford to pay a lawyer to look at a contract. So do you, do you, most of these producers have some sort of a contract they want you to sign to sign the rights over to the script, or is it just you know a handshake? No. Um, okay, so again, I'm going to go back to taking the, the, the four shorts that I sold last, uh, last year. Um, two of them, I, had, I made a contract. Um, you can go on WGA's website and get a, a standard contract. Um, I do have an agent who is also an attorney. Um, I, I don't usually have her look over the shorts. The shorts aren't really important. Feature length, yes, you're talking about larger money. But you can get the contracts online. Just as simple as saying, hey, here's the compensation, you know, on and on and on, sign, that's it. Um, I've only had one short that I was just pretty much, they wanted it, paying me through PayPal. That's it. But I did have one company that was in Albuquerque who had all that. I mean, they were ready. They had, I mean, I, I think the contract was like seven pages. And I was like, this is like you're paying $65. I'm like, wow. <laughs> it's longer and, than and, the actual and, short. <laughs> it, it, it is longer than that. And it was, and it, it kind of scared me. I have to be honest because it's like, what, what am I signing off here? I mean, seven page, uh-huh. I mean, this is a seven page contract. So, I mean, yes. So, but you just got to read between the lines. And like I said, it's, it, I would always, always have, um, a contract, not because of the payment, but because you need the writer's credit. You're getting paid that low. The most important thing is that you're being credited as a screenwriter. And let me yeah. tell you, I have seen contracts where it says you will be credited as screenplay, and then there's going to be co-writers, like the director's going to get co-writing credit. You've got to be careful on that, because yeah, I mean, they're going to try to take advantage of it. I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I don't believe that everybody's out to get screenwriters. Absolutely not. But they are out there every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You did. I would say that's absolutely the most critical piece of the contract is making sure that you get writing credit, or at the very least, you understand what writing credit you're going to get, so you go into it with your eyes open. Yeah, no, it's so important. I should have touched on that earlier. It is so important. I have seen, and I don't think it wasn't purposely done, but I've done contracts where I didn't see that, and it might have just been you know, for God, and just assume, of course, you're going to get screenwriting credit, but trust me, I speak up like, hey, you know, it might have been an accident, but somewhere in this we need to say 
I'll be credited as screenwriter or screenplay ads, but that's another thing I always tell writers, you know, look, look your information up on WGA and know what certain credits mean, you know, story by co-writer and make sure you get credit appropriately. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So, well, that's um, that's great, Jacob. Let's go ahead and, and wrap this up. Um, we've been going for a while. I'm curious if you just have maybe a couple of tips um, for people that are looking to do shorts, maybe just one or two quick tips that you can give us, and um, and we'll leave it at that. Absolutely. Um, if you're looking to sell the short, keep the budget low, keep the characters low, keep the locations, keep all that. Keep your page length down, too. Film festivals don't want, they have to cram in a bunch of shorts. They don't want 30 or 40 minutes. Keep it under 20, I always say 10. And know your audience, know the producers that you're pitching it to. If you're looking to produce your uh, own short, it's really important that you understand the filmmaking process and work within your budget. Don't expect a lot of money on shorts, but make sure you get the writing credit. It's the most important thing because that's what's going to launch your career. That's going to be the most credible piece of your, of your career. Perfect. Is there some place that um, Montana is online? Um, I can link to it in the show notes. Is, is this something people can go and watch? You can watch the trailer online. Um, I can send that link. I don't have that. But if you go on my video reel, which is on Vimeo, um, I think it's just Jacob and Stewart Screenwriter, um, it's about seven minutes of my video reel, and probably 65 to 70% of that is shorts. And a lot of that contains Montana. So you can go on there and kind of see. Okay, perfect. I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll, you can email me that link, and I'll put it in the show notes. Um, I wonder, are there any um, you know very famous shorts that are on YouTube that you might recommend that the audience go and watch? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a UCLA one um, called Voodoo, and it's an animation one that is phenomenal, um, and it's probably about four minutes, and I can't think of the name, but I can email it to you. But there's one about a... Um, uh, two Israelis and two Pakistanians who are at war, but a soccer game is on, and how they come together. There is no dialogue at all. It's just action, and it's just it's amazing. Uh, but you can go if, I, if you go on YouTube and just type in, you know, best short films or Academy Award short films. Watch those and just see. You know, there's no subtext. There's no subplot. I mean, not, not subtext. Sorry, there's no subplot. There's just you know, they, mm-hmm. they show the characters conflict who they are and they get out and that's mm-hmm. it it's that simple so perfect well once again jacob i really appreciate your taking the time to talk with me i think it's been very informative i know i've learned a lot so hopefully the audience has learned something too all right yeah uh, good talking to you i will uh, talk to you later jacob's going to be teaching a class on december 14th at the selling your screenplay classes it's going to be all about the specific nuts and bolts of writing selling and producing a short screenplay As you can tell from the interview, he has quite a bit of experience doing short films, so I think this will be a very educational class. If you take this class, you will come away with everything you need to know to write, sell, and produce short screenplays. If you're looking to get your first few writing credits, you're not going to want to miss this class. I'm looking forward to it myself. I think I'm going to learn a lot. If you'd like to learn more about this class, go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash classes. All the classes that I do are recorded and posted in the Selling Your Screenplay forum. I'm slowly building a nice library of online classes. I currently have three classes that you can watch anytime by joining SYS Select. The first class is called Choosing a Marketable Concept, and it covers everything you need to know to find a concept that can sell. I really believe this is one of the most overlooked and critical steps in the screenwriting process. If you fail at this step, everything you do afterwards can be a big waste of time. The second class is called Before You Begin to Write Your Screenplay and covers all the preparation you should do before you actually begin writing your screenplay. If you struggle with structure or your script falls apart towards the end, it's usually because you didn't spend enough time really planning your screenplay. And in the third class, actor, director, and writer Paul Murray teaches Actor Bait, How to Write a Screenplay that Actors Will Love. If you'd like to learn about how you can view any of these classes or sign up for the next class that Jacob is teaching, just go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. In the next episode, I'm going to be dissecting the film Identity Thief.
It was written by screenwriter and podcaster Craig Mazin. Craig is one half of the Script Notes podcast, and they're always reviewing other people's screenplays, so I thought it would be fun to review one of his. I think there are a lot of lessons we can learn from this film, both good and bad. It's currently available on HBO Go, so if you have a moment, try and check it out before the next podcast, which will be released on December 16th. So in this episode's writing words section, I wanted to talk about one of the main takeaways that I got from the interview with Jacob. A few years ago, I was at a screenwriting conference and I watched a panel with the two original showrunners from the television show Smallville. One of the things they said that really resonated with me is that to be a successful writer, you have to be very entrepreneurial. And I really believe this. When you start writing a screenplay, you're really starting a small business. A lot of the things that entrepreneurs think about when starting their business are the same sorts of things that writers should be thinking about. One of the things that impresses me about Jacob is how entrepreneurial he is. Look at what he's done. Obviously, he's learned a lot about physical production and directing and producing some of his shorts, but he's created a whole service, Screenwriting Staff in Utopia, that helps screenwriters sell their material. And the offshoot of that is that he's talking with producers who are looking for material. So he's not only helping other screenwriters, he's helping himself as a screenwriter. And to some degree, I've done the same thing with SellingYourScreenplay.com. I've gotten to know several producers through my site, too, and have started to build relationships with them. So the point is, being a screenwriter isn't just about writing. You've got to be out there trying all sorts of things to get your career moving. I've actually thought about this a good bit lately. I've been trying to come up with some sort of a service that independent producers would find valuable. If I could create a podcast or a blog or some sort of iPhone app that helped independent producers, I'd be on the front lines with them, meeting them, networking with them, and hopefully pitching my screenplays. So far, I just haven't quite figured out what that high-quality content would be to attract the producers, but I'm thinking about it. If anyone has any ideas, let me know. Or better yet, if you have a great idea like this, take action and get it rolling. So that's the episode. I hope you found it interesting. As always, thank you for listening.